Hey, welcome everyone. So glad you're joining us today, whether you're online or with us at one of our physical locations. I just believe God is gonna answer prayer this morning as we join together. So would we start this morning off right? Um, just wherever you're at, let's begin to just praise God together. Let's just begin to thank him for the blood. Thank him for, for what he's done to set us free. Thank you for the cross. Let's sing this. It wasn't for nothing that you shed your blood. So I'm going to live like my shame is gone. I won't be shackled to the way I was. Oh, I'm going to live like my chains are gone. Going now, my sin is dead and gone, and I sing hallelujah. It's done, it's done, it's he is risen, it is done, and I sing hallelujah. Oh, praise is a weapon I will love. Shout like the battle's won. Oh, fall back, devil, cause your time is up. Oh, I'm gonna live like the stone is gone. It's gone.
but there is a promise. And there is a promise that points beyond my failure. And there is a still voice to silence all my fears. For even the worst of my mistakes are miracles in stripes I am healed with one touch I am made whole you have spoken and I know that it is so in the storm you are peace in your love it won't let me go
I want to welcome you to our second week of prayer and fasting. Welcome those who are online and to all of our campuses. This week we're going to begin thinking about, praying about, and believing for the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts. I want to encourage you and your hope in Christ Jesus in the next few minutes that we have together. I grew up in a traditional Christian home, and I also attended, as a young person, a traditional denominational church, but we learned some very precious hymns during that time, and I still love many of them today, but there's one specific one that meant a great deal to me. There were several, but this one really meant a lot to me. By the way, if you don't know me, my name is Sam Hawkins. The one that I love the most and wanted to speak about today is called My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. It was written in 1834 by a young cabinet maker in London, England. One early morning as he was beginning his work day, the Holy Spirit began to descend on him, began to deal with his soul. It literally, as Jesus said, just rose up in him like a well, just bubbling up, a spring. And he began to hear words and music. And as he did, he took out a sheet of paper and he began to write very specific words, the words that the Lord gave him as a hope. His name was Edward Mote. And as Edward wrote the words, he received this full hymn from the Lord all at one time in one morning. Just a few days later, Sunday came along. And while he was in the service, he heard that a close friend's wife who had become very ill was in need of help. And it was his desire to do what he could. So quickly after the service he left and he went to the home of his friends just to visit with them. And Edward pulled out the piece of paper <clears throat> where he had written the hymn. And according to the story, he began to sing these words to a very fearful and distraught family. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood, they comfort me. There is an encouragement. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. The hymn brought great comfort and it brought encouragement to the woman and to her family. It restored them from fear and discouragement. It brought them the joy of the Lord and it brought hope into their home. The prophet Jeremiah tells us in the 29th chapter, verses 11 through 13, he assured us of something. He said that God's plan for each of our lives is very unique. Quote, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. They're plans for welfare. They're not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come to me, pray to me. And he said, I will listen to you. And you will seek me and you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. The Lord also tells us in Proverbs chapter 8 verse 17. I love those who love me. And those who diligently seek me will find me. We are all challenged at this time with many new and disturbing changes in our lives. All of us. The greatest way to gain and keep our balance in these times is to chase the Lord. And to live in his presence. He's always ready to listen to us, encourage us, guide us through every circumstance we face now and in the future. He has a plan. It's his pleasure as our heavenly father to love us in this way. The apostle Paul in a letter of encouragement to the believers in Ephesus wrote these words. In Ephesians chapter 1 verses 18 and 19. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? 
What is the surpassing greatness of his power toward those of us who believe? There's that word again, hope. Our hope has to be built around knowing and loving Christ, nothing else. Nothing else. Because what we hope for in life is central to how we will live our life. We need to center our hope on Jesus alone. I believe the second most important action we can take to keep our hope centered on the Lord is allowing Jesus to bless others through our life. Each of us, regardless of our circumstances, can choose to become an opportunity for the Lord by loving someone else through us. This is how we keep our hope alive, by giving ourselves away in love, through encouragement, through service. A number of years ago, the Lord led me to look into the life of a lady in our nation's history for the very purpose of understanding the power of hope. She was born in 1880, and I'm sure that many of you will recognize who she is immediately. She was blind and deaf at birth. To say that Helen Keller would be challenged in life was a radical understatement. At that time, the world considered a person with these challenges literally to be hopeless, with no chance of having a normal life or making any contribution to their society. But Helen had dedicated friends. She had workers who gathered around her. And because of their assistance, she was able to accomplish great things according to what God had given her, which was a tenacious spirit. She became a symbol of hope for millions of people around the world. And then in the year 1952, the reports of Helen's accomplishments and her visionary ability circulated within the leadership of a struggling, tiny nation, a nation that the world said would not survive even days. The new nation of Israel invited her to visit. She accepted their invitation. And as she exited the plane in Tel Aviv, she was met by Israeli officials and leaders, and within just a couple of hours, she arrived at a village for the blind in Israel. Wasting no time, she immediately began meeting and communicating with all the villagers. And while continuing to communicate with the villagers, she began to speak to the Israeli officials that were accompanying her. And she began to ask them to completely reconstruct the village. She explained to them how important it was to create a normal environment that would challenge the blind villagers. She had first-hand knowledge of the dangers of being isolated. She knew the villagers would respond in a positive way to the challenge of being with seeing neighbors. Helen knew the grace of God worked best when we serve him, when we love others and function as a living and productive community with each other. From experience, she knew this would break the destructive isolation that accompanied the blind, the thing that bound them the most. Fortunately, the Israeli government listened to her request, and they acted immediately. While she was still on her visit, Israel renamed the village from Hava Arim, meaning village of the blind, to Or Adoni, meaning light of God. Helen's suggestion transformed how the Israeli people viewed and treated all citizens with physical infirmities regardless of their problem. She helped suffering people become valuable neighbors and citizens in their town and nation. This blind and deaf woman infused hope into the life of every blind and infirmed person in Israel, including many other nations. A seemingly hopeless child born with terrible maladies Maladies that isolated her for many years. With the help of others, she grew into a mature woman who was used by God to transform the lives of millions just a short generation ago. You see, hope works as we share our lives together with others who are isolated because of a malady or perhaps because of fear. Try this out next week. Chase God in prayer. 
asking him to give you an opportunity to share your love for Christ with someone who's isolated by fear or difficult circumstances. This will move the Holy Spirit to infuse life into the deepest part of your soul and allow the Lord to lead you to effectively share yourself with someone else, bringing them to him. The best medicine for the effects of isolation is to serve others. God will restore and fill your heart with hope. The Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter command us. And Peter said in 1 Peter 1.13, Therefore gird your minds for action. Keep sober in the spirit, but fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hope's how we make it every day. Let's choose it today. Father, we love you. We thank you for this moment in time. Lord, I do pray that you will enlighten the eyes of our heart so that we can begin to see life as you view it. We can openly, honestly, truthfully see you in all things. We love you and we thank you for this moment in time that we've been allowed to live. For the next 25 minutes, we want you to find and seek a place with God personally so that you can take this time to help you get started. We provide you with some prayer resources. You can see them here. We have them at each end uh, of, of the platform. We hope and pray this morning, this time, this day, this week, will be a radical moment of change in your life and that you'll be able to reach those who are isolated and suffering. For those of you who are watching online, you can visit our church website at churchofthekeen.com. This is 21 days, 21 days of fasting and prayer. If you have a prayer request, you can submit those by texting the word prayer to 822-822. That's 822-822. Or you can fill out a prayer request card in the seat in the back, back of the seat in front of you. Once they're filled out, simply place them on the middle of the stage and we'll pray for them together at the end of our time today.